Well, thank you so very much, and it's wonderful to be here. And I just love that we're bringing together artists and scholars and community leaders. It's really quite a privilege to be here. We heard yesterday and again today that today is the day for some discomfort. And so I'm going to ask everyone to turn inward a little bit into that discomfort, thinking about the, uh, your own intergenerational trauma that you are living with, because each of us is living with that. And while I'm going to talk about the work that I do today, recognizing in the past few months, having all of my grandparents be from the Ukraine, that the war there is part of my legacy of intergenerational trauma. And we each have that. And I'm going to ask you again to focus inward on your own stories, your own trauma, and sit with the discomfort of that as hopefully we move from that through healing to flow. What do we mean by intergenerational trauma? Well, I think everybody here knows exactly what we mean. And it really has to do with when, as descendants of someone who experienced trauma before, we show some of the effects, the emotional effects, the behavioral effects, the interpersonal effects of what that person, our ancestor, or the communities we come from, experienced in terrifying, terrifying, horrific situations. And just like those before us who were traumatized, we live with some of the legacy inside of us. That is intergenerational trauma. In the African-American community, which is the community that I work with in Atlanta, Georgia, just a few blocks from the home of Reverend Martin Luther King, we know that for black Americans, they were descended from enslaved people. And so the trauma that they live with is the trauma of slavery. And as structural racism persists and is really in full force right now in our country, it's not just the legacy or the history of that trauma, but how it gets perpetuated every day in small and large ways. And so the women that I work with have to cope with that intergenerational trauma as well as the ongoing trauma in their lives, the structural oppression and racism. Unfortunately, when that occurs, there's um, often a lot of difficulties that come with it. Lots of, think about your own trauma story. Think about your own intergenerational trauma. What kind of physical symptoms do you feel related to it? Do you have headaches? Do you have stomach aches? What kind of psychological problems do you bring to the table because of it? Has it affected your self-esteem, how you feel about yourself? We heard about helplessness yesterday and depression and post-traumatic stress. One of the very powerful presentations yesterday was a mother's story about the death of her son to suicide. All of the women in our project experienced racism and continue to. Intergenerational trauma related to family violence, related to child abuse, child neglect, witnessing domestic violence, and being in an abusive relationship. And those combined intergenerational traumas made them feel so badly about themselves, so helpless, so hopeless, that they felt like the only way out was to attempt suicide or die by suicide. That's how they get into our program. And it is taking many women from the, basically the bottom of their lives and trying to build a community and building a community to move forward. And we know when there's so much trauma, we just heard about how hard it is to trust when we have trauma, how hard it is really to trust ourselves, to trust other people. And, and that trust makes relationships difficult. And so we end up reenacting that intergenerational trauma in our current relationships so that it keeps getting passed down generation to generation, 
And it's imperative, imperative that we stop that cycle. And then along with that cycle, the internalized oppression and racism that the women I work with experience. And so in the early 90s, we started a project called the NIA Project. NIA is a Kwanzaa word that stands for purpose. And I think a critical part of well-being is to find a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. We've worked with over 2,000 low-income African-American women, all of whom have a history of childhood maltreatment, domestic violence, and suicidal behavior, as well as the legacy of racism. People have talked here a lot about the different countries and cultures they come from, the different groups of people they work with at the individual level, at the community level. And we all know that the work we do must be culturally responsive. And that work, what works in one country or in one community is not going to be the same thing that works in another country or culture and community. And we're going to need to adapt it and do things from the ground up. And so the work that we do, really, we strive to be sensitive to the historical effects of trauma, the family trauma, and the interpersonal traumas that have affected the lives of the women. We've heard so much today. We heard from our religious leaders today. We heard yesterday about belonging and how critical belonging is to our well-being. And so we've developed a group-based program because we think that working together as a group, as a community, builds a sense of belonging. And that is critical to the healing process. As was mentioned earlier, I was a professional ballet dancer. I certainly, well, I still do my best to integrate the arts and psychology. Part of the group-based program that we do is an expressive arts program with art and theater and music and dance. And I must say, I'm learning so much from the artists here about new things we can try and integrate into this program. In addition to that, we really believe that people sharing their narratives, their stories, is so important. So many people have lives of trauma that they weren't allowed to speak about. And so sharing our narratives, which people have been doing here, is key to the healing process. And we focus on making meaning. I've been really inspired by the ba uh, little badges here that well-being inspires well-doing. And I think that what we try to do in our project is increase the well-being of the people that we work with, of the women in our program, through healing. And that in turn, they end up doing more well-doing. We think that empowering people, transforming their lives, helping them heal, enables them to do good. But it also means that in the process, we need to pay attention to our own well-being so that we can continue to do good. And so I'm talking about a program that focuses on individual well-being and community well-being in the face of intergenerational trauma. But we need to do such programs alongside of programs that build and strengthen family bonds and resilience and as we've heard about so much here today, really promoting, and today, yesterday, throughout this time, promoting our communities to reduce violence in families, in couples, in communities, and the racism and oppression that people experience. And so I'm hoping that we're going to be able to see just a few words from one of the women in our program who, as she's gone through her own healing journey, has been doing good. My great-great-grandfather purchased this property in 1882. Donna Han McCoy's great-great-grandfather, Reuben Gay, had been raised a slave who used his freedom after the Civil War to prosper. This is the second bond and my dad helped build this barn. It was built in 1952. Building this home in Fayette County and owning hundreds of acres of farmland. Generations of Gay's family, including Donna, now 60 years old, 
were raised here. I just submitted to the Georgia State Preservation and the National Park, and this will be the first African American historical landmark in Fayette County, Georgia. And his descendants still inhabit these hundreds of acres, many buried in the same cemetery just up the road where he was laid to rest. This is his grave here. Donna's passion for her family's history is part of how she has helped to heal her traumatic past, one in which she was kidnapped and raped as an adult, one in which she grew up in an alcoholic home she fled at just 15 years old. So I end up being one of those women that was on the streets. I was standing on the street corner down by the Fox Theater, and that's where it all began for me, trying to survive on my own, looking for love, because it wasn't at home. I have a safety list. Donna tried to take her life three times. It was one of those times hospitalized at Grady Hospital in downtown Atlanta that she learned of the NIA project. It gave me life, and I took that, and I kept coming and kept coming. In the midst of, there was things happening along the way, but I just kept coming, and I started having flashbacks. And so I'm hoping that as you each now focus inside again, you can think about how you can move beyond that discomfort based on your own history of interpersonal or intergenerational trauma through the process of healing and continuing to do good in the world. Thank you very much.